In today's episode, we open our Bibles to Judges, chapter 10. In this chapter, God raises up two more deliverers, Tola and Jair. But Israel continued to chase after the gods of the nations around them, forsaking Yahweh who had delivered them time and again. As a result, God allows them to be oppressed by the Philistines and the Ammonites for 18 years. And when Israel cried out to God for help, he initially rejects them and tells them to go to their false gods. But God has compassion on them, and he prepares to raise up another deliverer. Good morning and blessed Easter tide to you. Today is Tuesday, April 11th, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word, where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Thy Strong Word is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Explore their many offerings of foreign language materials rooted in the Lutheran tradition on their website at lhfmissions.org. Well, please join me in welcoming my guest this morning, one of our fond regular contributors to the show, the Reverend John Lukomsky, Pastor Emeritus and co-host of Wrestling with the Basics on KFU Radio, which airs on Saturdays at 9 a.m. Be sure to check it out. Pastor Lukomsky, welcome back to the show. Good to be back. Did you have a good Easter, Pastor Boo? Very good, but very busy, as you might imagine. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I, you know, I don't have a, a super large congregation, but we still had, uh, you know, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday Vigil, two services and a big Easter breakfast on Easter morning. So needless to say, I pretty much just slept all day yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember those days. I had a taste of it because I was preaching in a, a round robin uh, Lenten series, and then I did fill in for a couple of Sundays, and I thought, oh, I forgot how much work this is. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> you know, and then, it, it, say, then you go right into whole... Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was going to say it is a lot of work and it's a lot of mental work. You know, I think mm. physical, you know, we're not going to compete with, you know, those guys out there digging ditches, but it, there's a lot of just emotional and physical work uh, that really is involved and it just leaves you worn out. But then you were going to say that then we go into Holy Re. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I was going to say. You have that whole lit for six weeks and then then it gets worse. <laughs> and then, like you said, you've got Thursday and Friday. Uh, and and uh, do you have a couple of services on Easter or just one or? We had two. Yeah. Well, let's see. There you go. You've got and, and you are. I remember that you're just you're just really uh, emotionally and physically, even though it isn't hard physical work, you're physically exhausted. You're well, good. I'm glad you got rested up. And now you turn around and you've got to do the radio show and go back to all the other pastoral things. It doesn't stop. Oh, does well, you know, I, I should say I get to. Right. I'm I just yeah. every day that I get to be on the radio with you guys. It's amazing. And then I just can't believe how blessed I am when I get to show up to my work, which happens to be sharing the gospel with people. And I just, you know, I wouldn't do anything else. And I've done a, a lot of things in my life. And I still wouldn't do anything else. I, I'm sure you agree. Well, and you, you hit the highlight right there, the getting to share the gospel. Uh, uh, and especially when you, you're dealing with people that are just Sponge. They just soak it up. Uh, the more you tell them about the love of God, you can just see it on their face that it's just just the greatest thing that they've had. So you're right. It, it, it is a very, very difficult job, especially this time of the year. Did you have any extra funerals? Because it seems like the devil kind of puts a little extra burden on us a lot of times. Uh, did you have anything extra like that going on? No, I was blessed. You know, no, no funerals this time around. No, of course, I would usually get to plan weddings. No weddings did I have planned. Uh, nothing really extra. Just got to concentrate on giving uh, the best message that I could and let the Holy Spirit do the rest with it. You know, I did get to do, and I've been doing this since I've become a pastor, but this is new to my congregation. I introduced to them the Easter vigil on Saturday oh, night with, okay. with the bonfire outside and the moving into the darkened worship space in, in stages. And um, for, I think, I think this is my third year here doing this, uh, we had about 50 people, which is considerable for a pretty late service. And it was wonderful. Oh, 
Um, and and what? Uh, see, we we uh, we always had a Saturday night service, so it was just natural for us then to have the Easter vigil uh, on Holy Week. And it is it's just a wonderful addition to all of the worship services. But again, yet another service that needs to be prepared. But it, it's worth it. Like I said, it's really worth it. Although you do need to take a little bit of break after. <laughs> So. Well, and that is important. I had a, a board of elders meeting, which is nice because it's just it's such an encouraging group of men. So that didn't necessarily bother me. But I did have some meetings on on Easter Monday. But otherwise, oh. like I said, I uh, I tried to spend it pretty relaxed. Um, but anyway, today now we've gathered back around the radio and we're going to be talking, uh, continuing in Judges which is, uh, I think, have been it's just been a fascinating topic so far because I guess I have to admit, Judges is one of those books where, aside from learning about it in Sunday school and touching on it in seminary, I, I guess I never really studied Judges very much, which is why I picked it. Uh, what about you, brother? Well, I, I, to be honest with you, I hadn't really heard of Tola or Jer the Gilead before. <laughs> right, fair, exactly. You, 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 yeah, some of the big guys we know. Uh, uh, and my wife, of course, who is a, uh, has read through the Bible, I don't know how many times, or she, she knows all this stuff. So I had to go consult with her about who these guys were. But you're right. Uh, they're not the, they're not in the lectionary. So we don't ever touch upon any of them there. And so other than maybe Gideon and, and Deborah, some of the other uh, major judges in Sunday school, yeah, you're right. They kind of get passed over. And yet it's a great book because it's essentially our life story. It's just talking about people like us and, and the author trying to figure out, well, how is God involved in all of these everyday activities that are going on? So, Well, I tell you what, you know, as we try to direct our minds toward these two new minor judges, which really we don't learn a whole lot about, I think it's going to open up a lot of conversation around the idea of God's anger, because that's really the focus of this particular chapter. But before we dig into it, I think it'd be great for us to pause just for a moment, start our time together in prayer. And as always, I want to invite you to uh, lead us in that prayer. Okay. And I just want to say uh, something to our, our board operator. For some reason, you're, you're cutting out. So I'm only getting like maybe two thirds of the comments they're making. So we'll, we'll press on here. I did catch the part about you wanting me to say a prayer. So we, we will do that. <laughs> Pastor Boo. Um, oh, Lord, indeed, do, do give us the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, sometimes we read these Old Testament stories and they seem so distant, so different than what we're, we're experiencing. And, and yet they're not. Uh, help us to to open our hearts and minds to see you know, these are Christians just like us, believers just like us. And, and, and we're going to see a pattern of how God deals with us. Uh, and, and may we see that then in our day-to-day -day lives as well. But may I see most of all that you're always a God that deals with us in mercy, who who is uh, once put an end to our misery. Uh, in in your mercy, O oh Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm sorry that you're having trouble uh, hearing me. Hopefully, we'll be able to uh, uh, make our way through it. Um, you know, I'm going to start by going ahead and reading out the text. I'm just going to read, though, verses 1 through 5, which gives us uh, just an indication of these two new, what we call so-called minor judges. Here we go. After Abilamelech, there arose to save Israel Tola, the son of Pua, son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he lived at Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty-three years. Then he died and was buried at Shamir. After him arose Jair the Gileadite, who judged Israel twenty-two years. And he had thirty sons who rode on thirty donkeys. And they had thirty cities called Havoth Jair to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Kamom. Well, brother, that's the first five verses, and that's all it tells us about these two judges. Um, we call them minor judges because we don't know a lot, but that doesn't mean they didn't do a lot. Uh, tell, tell us what we do know. Well, so, so just a couple of comments. First of all, I think what strikes you right away is all the detail here. Uh, we, we get a little bit of their genealogy. We, we're told about where they lived. We're given a, a time framework. 
Uh, and I think it's important to remember that we're, we're just reading history here. Well, well, not just, is it? <laughs> but but it is history. I, I, I think the danger is, and, and maybe this comes from the Sunday school, where we would take out this story and take out that story. And here's the lesson, and here's what God's trying to teach us. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, no, these are just these are historical records. These are real people. These are events that actually took place. The author, of course, is wrestling with the question we wrestle with. Where is God in all of this? How is he in control of this? What is he doing in all of these situations? But but let's not turn this into Aesop's fables or something like that. No, these are all real people, real history. Uh, and, of course, God's working in our history, too. And that's our question. How, how, uh, how and why is he doing the things he's doing? Um, the, the other thing I think that I really love about these two guys is, is if you work with the, the, the big, uh, the, the major, uh, uh, judges, it seems like Israel is always in turmoil. And I found it kind of comforting to know for what was it like 40 some years here, things were going along pretty smoothly. Um, not that there wasn't trouble because, uh, we were told that this toll law, uh, saved Israel. So obviously they were still having struggles and trials. But it's kind of nice to know that, yeah, as as believers, we'll have years and years and years where nothing really significant happens. Life is just going on, and, and God gives us leaders to watch over and care for us, and we should be happy in these times of relative peace. I think that's a really good point. We don't learn a lot or really anything about outside nations coming to bother them, so the saving that's going on, I guess, must be a lot of internal stuff, but nothing to the level of a drama that might require, you know, a couple chapters to explain it to us. Uh, and, and I think this relative peace doesn't negate the fact that God still is sending judges among them to lead them and guide them, as you pointed out. Um, yeah. And so I think that's a, that's a really good point, because I think American Christians have experienced that themselves, you know, in the past Gosh, 40, 50, 60 years, American Christians have enjoyed, well, pretty good favor among the culture, among the government, among the people. And in these last days, things are turning turning a little bit. And it makes you wonder if there isn't some connection to the fact, as we'll read here in a few minutes, the people of Israel, I guess, comforted by the relative peace and security of their land, once again, started to turn away from God. You, you know, I, I really like that last phrase, comforted by the relative peace. Because, see, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking, we all figure if, if God would just give us some peace, right, then we'd be really good, upstanding Christians, wouldn't we? I mean, if we didn't have all the problems and trials, well, we would just be the finest believers you could find anywhere. But, but see, that's what's going on behind her. So God gave them that relative peace. He gave them apparently two pretty decent leaders. Did that stop them from turning to idolatry? No, because the problem isn't what's going on outside of us. See, that's what we think. It's what's going on outside of us that's infecting our faith. But what affects our faith is the fact that we're born sinners. Is what Jesus says, what comes out of the heart. That's where the problem is. And so, yeah, God could give us a, a, a period of relative peace. Would that make us better? No, no. What, what we would do is just what you suggested. We would get comfortable and we would begin to think that we are the reasons that we have a relative peace. And we begin to think that that's what's life about having all of this, everything just hunky dory. And, but no, we see in this text, no. No, that doesn't keep us believers, but sad to say, we usually fall back into idolatry. We usually end up putting our faith in those things of peace rather than the one who gives us the peace. Yeah, that, that is such a temptation when there are no trials or tribulations, when, when, the, uh, when we feel like we're not being persecuted, we just get, as you said, really comfortable. Now, though this is a little bit off topic, but it is from the text. It says, um, after uh, Tola, there arose Jair, the Gileadite, who judged Israel for 22 years. And it describes him, I think, in a kind of a unique way. It says he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys who had 30 cities. Uh, I, I guess this is indicating his, his wealth, but what, what a strange, I guess, phrase or way to describe them. So, so one commentator that I read, and, 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 and maybe that's not putting the best construction on things, but maybe the suggestion here is just what you said before about the comfort and the relative peace, that 
they've they've done so well now that he can have many many children and they they've settled many many cities and and they're beginning to think well how could things get any better we've got everything under control everything is just exactly the way we want it to be and, and that then eventually leads to the very sad things that happen in, in the next verses well like i said maybe that's maybe that's not putting the best construction on the thing but that is at least one opinion that i read yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I, I think the equivalent of a donkey would be like saying something to the fact of, you know, he had 30 sons and they were all very wealthy. They all had nice cars and they all ran uh, <laughs> prosperous cities. These would be tent cities, I suppose. And and the author in Judges is saying, uh, by the way, you we even know about these cities today. It's Havath Jair. That's why they call them that. So yeah. uh, it's kind of neat. He's connecting it to his hearer's experience. You know, these cities that you know about, well, that's who I'm talking about, Jair the Gileadite. Oh, and now, see, now you really, you, you just had made me smile because isn't that, our, our children all have nice cars. Man, we've arrived, <laughs> haven't we? But see, that's the problem. No, that isn't a good thing that our children have nice cars. Well, it is. I'm not complaining about that. But is that really what, what right. being Christian is all about? That all of our kids, they have their nice homes and they have their nice cars. And I'm thinking, that's nothing. That's absolutely nothing. We'd be better off if our kids didn't have anything, but they had faith. That's what's crucial. Uh, but certainly, so, thank you. Yeah, certainly yeah. nothing wrong. I mean, you know, you don't have to walk everywhere to be faithful. No. But at the same time, yeah, it makes you wonder what's being communicated here. Is this saying that there's this abundance of wealth, which is making what happens next even that much more striking? Um, or, uh, or is it an indication that God's blessing them? You know, the, while we don't want to get into that trap of saying that, you know, God blesses faith by giving material wealth and health in this life. We definitely want to stay away from that. It is something God has done, though. You know, we think of Solomon and others. So I guess it's a little hard for us to really discern what's going on here. But I lean towards what I think you do, too. And that is we're really being shown that things are really peaceful. And despite the peace, um, verse six literally begins with, the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh. So, you know, even so they can't say, well, Lord, if you would just give us peace from our enemies for a little yeah. while, then we could dedicate and devote ourselves to you because they don't. So, so what happens is you've got peace. <laughs> you've got your nice car and your night house. And I, and, oh, man, I have to pray. I, well, guess what? It made no difference. Isn't that crazy? I've still got all this nice stuff. In fact, you know, I, I'm not going to church anymore. I'm not worshiping God. Yeah. Hey, you know what? Let's see what our buddies are doing, what our friends are doing. Let's just see, because that's what I'm thinking. I think a lot of this really has nothing to do with worship at all. It just has to do with what everyone else is doing around us. Well, don't you want to do what everyone else is doing? You want to fit in? Uh, but but see, there you go. It, it begins to undermine the faith because you forget that the reason you have relatives, the reason you have a nice car, and the reason you have a nice home is because these are gifts given you by God who gives them out of graciousness. <laughs> and right. so he will continue to give them, even though you're not showing him the, the concern and the respect and the worship that you should. But that won't last forever. No, no. And, and, and it won't last forever because he loves you. If he didn't love you, he would just let it go on that way. But because right. he let you see the results of your sinfulness. Well, I want to add two more verses so that we can get into what happens next, because in verses six and seven, it said, or pardon me, I'm going to add one more verse. It's a long verse. One more verse. Verse six. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh and served the Baals and the Asheroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. They forsook the Lord or forsook Yahweh. And did not serve him. So we get seven different types of gods that the people served. Um, the Baals and the Asheroth, of course, are the Canaanite gods. But then basically everybody, the Syrian gods, the Sidon gods, the Moab gods, the Ammonite gods, the Philistine gods. Boy, there's not a god that these guys did not serve, despite only the one true god ever not only showing himself to him in might and power, but rescuing them free in their history. It just seems, you know, it just seems so improbable that they would give up on God who has proved himself and didn't have to time and again. But of course, 
you know, we can't judge because we do the same thing. Well, here's a quote. I, I quote from one of the commentaries I read, um, and, and it said, this is the most detailed list of the false gods they worshipped, and thus highlights the total spiritual corruption of the nation. Uh, so that's not me. That That's a quote. Uh, and and it, I mean, it says that they forsook the Lord. And, and you know, it struck me that it does seem ridiculous because these very gods that their ancestors had defeated so they could visit the land, and now they're worshiping these gods? <laughs> uh, and, and you know what really what really bothered me, uh, Pastor Boo, is it's not just that they worship these gods, but that phrase that they, uh, they forsook the Lord and they did not mm -hmm. serve him. I, I mean, I, I could kind of understand... We, we want to cover all of our bases, right? So we might as well worship the gods, the Ammonites and the Canaanites and these other gods, you know. But why would you stop worshiping your own god? That just doesn't make any sense at all. But it just shows you how... And doesn't it really show you that I think at this point people have, have a disconnect? They don't think there's any relationship between their day-to-day -day life and God at all. And so we're just doing whatever the culture is doing presently in our time or place. And who doesn't want to be buddies with your neighbors? So let's just do what they're doing. But so there's not really, I don't think there's any faith here at all. Not even in the false gods. They're just being worshipped because it's it's what you do uh, at this time. Mm, that's an interesting perspective. You know, I what I thought was interesting is there's a little bit of a cross-reference here to Deuteronomy 31. And as I read it, it, it reminds me that God knew that all of this was going to happen. Deuteronomy 31, 16, Moses is about to die, and uh, God says, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering. They will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. So what's what's interesting about that to me isn't really that God knew what was going to happen. I mean, that's not very interesting. God knows everything. What's interesting is that despite knowing everything, God keeps sending them saviors. He keeps sending them rescuers. He keeps pulling them out of their problems. He keeps his covenant, which is the nature of God. But if God were more like us, then he would uh, I would just be done with them. You know, how many times must I forgive my brother? And you and, and see, that, that's exactly the point then, isn't it? They, they think that God had favored them because they were favorable, right? They're God's people. So naturally, he's going to do good things for us. And, and I think what the scripture shows over and over again is the only reason God did anything for these people was because he is a gracious and merciful God. He just loves people. And because he loves people, he does good things for them, whether they deserve it or not. Uh, and so we have this pattern then where we begin to think that it's because of us and how good we are and don't we deserve all these things. I, I think it's the pattern that we're going through in the United States right now that we really think we're really a lot better nation than most other nations. We actually deserve all these things that God has showered with over the last 200 years. And, and sad to say, we, we have to be constantly reminded, no, no, God doesn't give anything to people because they deserve it. God does everything out of gracious and mercy, and including what you just mentioned, the fact that he constantly sends us a savior, especially to the people who don't deserve it. Uh, and that's kind of the key thing, isn't it? That repentance, that recognition that it's all grace, it's all mercy, uh, and, and thank heavens that it is. And I don't want to read too much into it, but I suspect that some of the relative peace that they experienced over the past 40 years might have had something to do with the fact that they were adopting and inculcating themselves into the cultures of all all around them. So the more they gave in to their enemies and their neighbors and people who would rightly destroy them and people who they were called to destroy themselves, the more they just gave in, the more worldly peace they experienced, which they mistook for God being pleased with them. And And if that doesn't reflect American culture, I don't know what it is, just what you were saying. You know, we just think, well, look at us. You know, the more we give into the world, the more we um, don't stand up for our own ideals against those others, well, then people are just going to like us better. But that doesn't always turn out to be the case in the end. 
Boy, I, boy, I, 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 I'd never thought of that, but that that resonates with me, Pastor Boo. And so you can kind of see it. You've got this, uh, this, this uh, Tola, and it says he saved them. And so they're still struggling under his rule, and he's still leading them and delivering them. But then, like you said, it gets a little more comfortable, and we start just going along with what's going on in the countries around us, and then we don't need to worry, right? Then there's no problem if we just compromise and just do what everyone else is doing, and then it finally leads to totally uh, uh, forsaking God. Because see, that's the thing. I, I was thinking of that passage where God says, no man can serve two masters for either you will hate the one and love the other. So as well, it seems strange to me that that he wouldn't just keep worshiping God and worshiping these other gods. But but the Bible clearly says that's not how it is. When you go after these other gods, you will automatically always leave the true God. Because see, that's the thing about the true God. He demands an exclusive worship. That will have no other gods. <laughs> so so you just can't do that. And as soon as you do worship with the other gods, you automatically then have ceased worshiping the the, the true God. But I, I like, I, I think you've got a point. That's probably why things are so peaceful, because they were just getting along with everybody else. And and no better way to get along with everybody else but just worship their gods. So, uh, yeah. Well, and then what happens next, which we'll talk about, well, I'll read right before the break, and then we'll get into it afterwards. But uh, with verses 7 and 8, we'll see. So the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites. And they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. For 18 years they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. And that's where we'll stop for now. And uh, we will take a quick break here, but when we come back, that's what we're going to talk about. You know, the anger of the Lord. What does that mean? Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me this morning is the Reverend John Lukomsky, Pastor Emeritus and co-host of Wrestling with the Basics, also on KFUO. Thank you for tuning in this morning as we make our way through Judges. Remember, you can reach out to me at PastorBoo at gmail.com with your feedback, or you can find me on Facebook too. Just ask any question you want or just to say hello. Thanks for listening to the program. And if I could ask you to do me a favor, and that is share your love of the show with your friends and family. Remind them that Thy Strong Word can be heard on the radio in St. Louis, live or on demand at kfuo.org, through the KFUO app, or even as a podcast on your favorite podcasting platform. They do so much to make sure the Word of Christ gets out to the nations, and so I thank you for tuning in and growing in faith with me and my guests each weekday morning. Well, Pastor Lukomsky, before the break, you know, I, I, I laid it down, verse 7. So the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel. The anger of the Lord is uh, an interesting phrase, one we see often and one that is often misunderstood and one where we like to think of God's anger as the anger of man, which isn't uh, perfect and righteous like God's anger is. So let's get into that. You know, what does it mean that God was angry well see it, it, it's it's a beautiful word isn't it because we tend to think of god as some kind of abstract thing uh and, and this is a word that reminds us no god god is a person he has feelings okay 
Uh, you're right. They're not like our sinful feelings, but they are still feelings. And and they're feelings that are motivated out of love for us. See, that that's the thing about God's anger. Uh, God gets angry because we're his children. He's a jealous God. Uh, he, he loves us and, and he knows what's good for us and what's best for us. Um, but, but of course, the children of Israel are saying, you don't know what's good for us. These other gods know what's good for us. So we're going to worship them. And, and they bring us peace when we worship them because we're no longer fighting with these people around us that, that you've caused us to fight uh, and, and, and make us uh, uh, evil in their sight. But of course, no, no, that's not going to work. These people are just going to turn on them the Israelites. They don't care whether you're worshiping their God or not. They have no sense of unity with you. They just want to overrun you. They want to drive you out, which of course is what's happening here. And so that those words, they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel this year. But, but that's what I love about the word anger, because no, God isn't some abstraction. Uh, God, God is very real. He's a person and, and he wants to have a personal relationship with you and me. In fact, he does. He does. Uh, so much so that he sent his own son to be one of us here on this world. That's that's how much he wanted to have a relationship with us, that he became one of us. You can't get any closer to someone, can you, than becoming what they are. Uh, so rather than staying up in the heavens, being his God self, he's on our flesh and blood. So anyway, it's just a great, great word. I, like you say, it's not human anger, but it right. is an anger of divine love. What an interesting way to look at it, because, you know, you think of these gods who are impotent. They don't they aren't really anything. They are uh, imaginations of their creators. They're 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 idols and rocks and stone and gold. And so they can't get angry. They can't have a relationship. <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking about when I do premarital counseling, actually, I should say often in postmarital counseling, you know, people will get in fights because we're people and they'll get angry with each other because we're sinners and and so you know a marriage will be one that is beset by lots of fights and anger and they'll come and they'll say well we're just fighting all the time and i often will say and i'm sure you have too oh good you know that's good news because what's worse than fighting is apathy is not caring is never having an argument you know not that not that a relationship that only is 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 you know defined by anger is a good one but it's still better than one where both parties don't even love each other enough to argue over things anymore. And, and so it's kind of, kind of in a very stretchy way, the same thing with God. It's because of his love for us that he gets angry. Otherwise, he would just simply wipe us out and not care a lick about it. But his jealousy, that is his desire for us to be with him alone, and his anger, um, they, are, they are righteous, righteous indignation. Um, they are done in a way that is holy and and not out of selfishness, but rather out of his just and his love. Um, so he is, he's angry. And then there is a consequence of his anger. And that is they get, and the phrase here is sold into the hand of the Philistines and the Ammonites. Um, interesting way to, again, describe God basically sending them in to oppress the people as punishment, as discipline. Um, it's really the language of slavery being sold into the hand of these enemies. And and so, so the two things that strike me, uh, uh, going back to the word jealousy, uh, see, jealousy means, like you said, that you, you don't want anyone else to to have this this person. Uh, but in the case of God, that's not a bad thing because there isn't any other gods. You know, like, like you said, when we worship other gods, we're just fooling ourselves. We're just being stupid. That's what we are exists in this world only one god who creates only one god who provides us with our daily bread only one god who truly cares for us so it's, it's a different kind of jealousy when god has it because he just wants us to face the reality and and i really do like that phrase sold them because this is how god often punishes us he just gives us what we want you you want to worship these other gods you want to be part of those cultures okay i will i will give them to you you belong to me see See, I, 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 but I'm the one that will just sell you off to these other people. And you can experience what life is like under these other pretend gods uh, because they are pretend gods. And therefore, all you're going to get is the wrath and anger of the people. There is no God there to intervene, no God to deliver you, no God to forgive you or God to save you. So if that's what you want, then, then have at it. 
but again, with the desire that we will wake up and realize that there's only one God who really cares. You said to get angry over it. So. Well, and what happens, of course, when he sells them into their hands is they go and they fight them. So verses 9 and 10. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. And the people of Israel cried out to Yahweh, saying, We have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and have served the Baals. Now, before we get into God's response, they get what they want. God gives them, as you pointed out, exactly the intentions of their heart. You don't want to serve me. You want to serve them. This is what life is like serving them. When they are now starting to be conquered, well, suddenly they want to cry out to the Lord again. And if that is not the epitome of our human nature, really nothing is. We, we rely and we sort of take for granted the blessings and peace that God gives us. We turn away from him. And then he has to send some cataclysm in our life for us to, to get our attention, to turn back to him. And, and whether, whether it's sending enemies their way, in the case of our friends here in Judges, or whether it's sickness or severe financial distress or um, the, the, the impending death or the death of a loved one or, or whatever it is in our life that makes us realize that there is more to life than this life and that we haven't been paying attention to our, to our God. But boy, boy, wouldn't it just be nice if we could turn to the Lord before he, he causes us <laughs> to have to? <laughs> well, and of course, see, that's going to be the question. Have they turned to God because they are truly repentant? I, I mean, the language is good here. Our God, they say, all right, now you're getting the point. These aren't your gods. They're not any gods of anybody. They're nothing. They're they're low Elohim. They're the not gods. That's what they're called in the Bible. So that's a good thing you're calling to our God. Now you recognize me who I am. But are you really? Or is it just the fact that, oh, you're 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 tired of the misery, you're tired of being attacked, and you think, well, maybe now if we come back to God, he'll make things better. Uh and and that of course isn't faith either, is it? That's just wanting to get our fleshly desires. It's the same thing, really. We're just still trying to get our fleshly desires satisfied, the desires of our sinful heart. So God's got to kind of put them into the test, isn't he, <laughs> in the next few verses. But but at least they've, they've done the right thing. At least this is the beginning, because you can't have faith if you don't turn to the Lord. That's an absolute necessity. You have to cry out to him, uh, and, and that's what they do did that well and let's let's look then yeah well, let's look then in verses yeah. 11 because god um you know god's not playing at this point <laughs> you know no. they, they turn back to him but you can see an impatience um in our lord's response this is going to be verses 11 through let's do 14 here we go and yahweh said to the people of israel did i not save you from the egyptians and from the amorites from the Ammonites and from the Philistines, the Sidonians also, and the Amalekites and the Maonites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, and I saved you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. You know, I, I just can't help but, you know, oh gosh, I just can't help but ponder these words because when in those times we take for granted the blessings of God and something bad comes along and we return to the Lord, one of the blessings of the faith that God has given us and the revelation of Scripture is that He's always there for us. He's always waiting. We proclaim it from our pulpits, you know, return. If you're the prodigal son or daughter, that's okay because the Father is there with open arms. Well, here they return, and God tells them, and it must have been frightening for them to hear the words, no, no, you've made your bed, go lie in it. Uh, what do you think? It, this is tough to hear from God. Well, and the thing is, it's a reality. And, and I suspect uh, most of our listeners have experienced this, uh, where there's some crisis or trial, maybe the loss of a loved one uh, or maybe some kind of illness. 
uh, or maybe a loss of a job, whatever it is. The, the world is filled with all kinds of things that are, 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 are cause us great despair, that oppress us. What was the words that was before it was used? Well, whatever it was, they were oppressed and uh, crushed, that uh, crush us. And, and, and we do because we're Christians. Uh, severely distressed was the other word that was used earlier. And we are, and we cry out to the Lord. And, and very often nothing happens. <laughs> right we cry out and True. nothing changes and we're wondering is is this the lord what's he saying is he saying he's not going to save us but but see this is where faith begins to to blossom and to grow because faith is hoping the things that are unseen see that's the problem all along that the israelites want to equate their relationship with god with what's going on in their daily life so well you know, everything is going fine. Well, then we must be all right with God. Well, let's go on and try some other gods, see how that goes. Problems come. We cry to the Lord. But but we have to understand that the Lord's with us, whatever the situation. Uh, the Lord is with us and loves us not only when every have, have a car and a new home, but he certainly loves and cares for us when we're struggling and when we're having trials. Uh, and, and that's what God's trying to evoke in these people, to disconnect between the fact that we've got blessings and that means God loves us and the fact that no, no, God just loves us no matter what happens in this evil, sinful world. And a lot of wicked, evil things will happen because of our sin and the sin around us. But the one thing that never changes is God's love and care for us. And see, what's really neat for us as Christians we would have the automatic answer to God who says, I'm not going to save you. Go, go trust in the gods you've been, you've been worshiping. No, no, we would say, no, no, Lord, that isn't how it works because you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to us. We know absolutely you love us no matter what because you gave up your only son so that we might be forgiven. Uh, so we, we have it better than the people of Israel, but they're still going to get it right here too. Uh, and I suppose we would say they're going to get it right because they— they know the promise that God was going to send someone. In fact, all these judges, don't you think, are simply a reflection of the greater promise that some to save and deliver them. And these judges are just kind of uh, 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 anti-types or type. I can't remember which, which one it is. Is it a type or anti-type? <laughs> but something that points ahead to the even greater one that God will send to save them. Well, they certainly are types of, you know, of the Lord, of course, imperfect ones. But, you know, you brought up something that's really important, and that is that God has made a promise to save them. He actually is not taking any pleasure. You know, we would take pleasure. The sinful human would take pleasure in being able to say, you know what, you have turned to these other gods and let them save you. But God doesn't take pleasure in that. In fact, I think there's a turn of phrase in the next couple of verses that illustrates that. I'm going to read this, verses 15 and 16. And the people of Israel said to Yahweh, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served Yahweh. And he became impatient over the misery of Israel. It's that last phrase that really stands out to me. Um, and maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it, it, the, the, the way that's translated here in the English, and God became impatient over their misery. It, it gives me the concept of him not, not saying like he, he was just growing tired of it, but rather he knows that all it takes for him is to turn away from these foreign gods because that's the source of their problem. And so he's literally becoming impatient because they won't do anything about their misery. They're putting away their foreign gods. They're turning back to him. That's all good. But God's just like, you know, <laughs> none of this had to be. He didn't take any pleasure in disciplining them. And and, and that I, I agree with you. Absolutely. Pastor Boo, that, that, that's the thing. He doesn't like people to suffer. He finds no pleasure or joy in that. He does get impatient with us when we are to listen and to obey his word. Because here's the thing we don't understand. God doesn't give commandments because he likes to boss people around, okay? He is God. He doesn't need to boss people around. People will do whatever he wants them to do because he's God. Right. If he gives a commandment, it's because he does not want you to be hurt or the people around you to be hurt. And when you break the commandments, that's what you're going to cause. You're going to cause misery. That's what you're going to do. Okay, and so naturally he gets impatient with us 
because misery is the last thing he wants us to have. It certainly is the last thing he wants our neighbor to have. So you're right. He just gets impatient. Why don't you do this early? Why did you make this go as long as you did? It's not what I wanted. Uh, but what he wants, of course, is for us to be saved and be forgiven. Um, yeah. But, so another, but another phrase they say, which I think is in a cosmic sense, kind of humorous, and it definitely is one that we've said before, is the people of Israel said to the Lord, this is verse 15, we have sinned. All right, good. So they confess their sins. Yep. Do to us whatever seems good to you, right? Thy will be done. And then, but this is what we want you to do, deliver us. So they're like, <laughs> you know, God's will be done, but save us, actually. I, I don't know. It, it's just, um, it seems kind of illogical, maybe shallow, but I think there is a desperation here where they're admitting, okay, we really have no choice. We we are praying your will be done, but if you're ta if you're taking suggestions, here it is. Save <laughs> us. Well, you know, so here's here's the thing. I, I find a parallel, and of course it's fresh in my mind, it's as yours because we just had the story of the thief on the cross, right? That comes up every holy week. And I thought it's the same thing with him, isn't it? He 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 says, I'm getting what I deserve. And, and that's that's a very key thing for repentance to be truly repentance. See, see, most repentance is I I'm not getting what I deserve. I don't like this misery and this struggle. You need to stop that, <laughs> okay? Whereas true repentance says, you know what? I deserve this. I deserve this. I, I look at this. And I realize, yeah, this is what I. Why am I surprised at this? Is it? This is the thing that I'm wrestling with, uh, uh, Pastor Boo, because I'm a 70 year old man. I've already had a major heart attack. I'm going to see the doctor this week, and and I know my days are numbered. Now I hope they're not numbered. I hope they're numbered in years, like 10 or 20 or 30 years. But I, I know oh, yes, too. they're they're numbered. But and, and I was thinking, and you know what? When I die. I can't say I don't deserve that. I do deserve that. I've sinned. The wage of sin is death. I, I, just like that thief on the cross, I'm going to get what I deserve. All right. And that's a crucial thing to understand. And yet he still is able to say, Lord, remember me in the kingdom. Uh, and, and my own personal opinion is I think he can say that because he heard Jesus pray, Father, forgive them. And he reflected on the fact that, well, maybe, maybe God can even forgive somebody like these people that are persecuting him, uh, but see, I, I, I'm so I, I take it a little more positive. I, I, I think it's more like, okay, we, we've come to understand that, that we're getting what we deserve, and indeed, if you don't save us, well, who could say that that we are wrong? Uh, are you are wrong? Uh, but but we 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 do want you to save us, and it's what you promised. It's what you promised. Um, and the thing that struck me about the thief on the cross is that he actually didn't get what he wanted, because he said, "Remember me in the kingdom." And Jesus said, I'm going to do better than that. Today you're going to be with me in paradise. <laughs> this isn't something off in the distance when I'll come back. I'll remember, you know. And, and I'm wondering if there isn't a little. I, I think I think, I think, think it's both. I, I think on the one hand, it's a good thing they say, but deliver us. Because that's what we ought to say to God. You made a promise to us, Lord. You said you were going to save us in Jesus Christ. You need to do that. But I suppose... I suppose you're right. They're only thinking about an earthly, temporary salvation from the Ammonites and whoever else is invading them. And of course, what God means is he's going to give them something far better than that. He's going to give them paradise. He's going to give them a place where they will never worry about any enemies, where there will literally no misery. There will be no oppression anymore. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's both. I, I think it's a good thing. And yet they probably too are, are looking for something that's only limited and temporary, not fully understanding what God has intended for them and most importantly for us as well. Well, this chapter ends on a cliffhanger, but we might as well get to it in the last two verses, verses 17 and 18. Then the Ammonites were called to arms and they encamped in Gilead. And the people of Israel came together, and they encamped at Mizpah. And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said one to another, Who is the man who will begin to fight against the Ammonites? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So this chapter uh, leaves us with the cliffhanger of who's going to stand up? Who, you know, the, the judges that were mentioned at the top of the show are gone. Tola and Jair, they're gone. We didn't hear much about them. So now, interestingly enough, the people are saying, 
who's it going to be next? And I don't think that they're dismissing God's power behind this. Basically, I read it as who is the next judge? You know, who is the next leader? Who is the next deliverer? Who will God raise up to deliver us? Um, and, and that's where this chapter ends. Um, and, and there's just two things that and the first actually goes back to the verses we read previously. Uh, and you, you, you alluded to this, the fact that they stopped worshiping the other gods. I, I do think we need to emphasize that. But where there is true repentance, there will always be the, the, the fruit of good works. You, you can't say in one side of your mouth, oh, God, we love you and worship you, deliver us. And then in the other mouth, be praying to Baal. Uh, so I think that's crucial that there is a uh, that there's real repentance here because it's showing itself in the fruits. Not that the fruits are the repentance, but certainly where there is true repentance, there will be the fruit. And 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 then we have this really neat conclusion: we we need someone to save us. See, that that's what's so nice in these last verses. They realize, like you said, they need another judge sent by God to deliver us. And and I think that's the lesson for us. Um, Repentance is not simply realizing we're doing something wrong and then thinking, okay, now I need to do better. Yeah, I'll take care of this, Lord. Just give me a chance. I'm going to really start praying to you now. I'm really going to start going to church. Trust me, God, all those things I wasn't doing, I'm going to start doing and everything will be fine and my life will be back where it should be. No, no. The, the true repentance is say, Lord, I not only need you to save me, but I need you to send me a savior. Because I've come to the realization that I'm going to do this again and again and again. I don't want to. Help me not to. But inevitably, I will. I'll fall back into the same. I'll start worshiping these gods again. I just will because that's how I am. I'm a sinner from birth. So you need to send someone to me who will deliver me and save me. So I think that's what's really neat. And, and you're going to have that, aren't you, the next time you get together? God will send a most unlikely savior, <laughs> the, 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 the son of a prostitute of all things. Wow, that doesn't seem like the guy that would be a savior, but I'm jumping the gun now and getting into your material for tomorrow. That's right. Jeff Fath is who we're going to be talking about tomorrow. Uh, anything else? You know, that's such a beautiful note to end it on, though, our need for a savior, especially this Easter tide week. You know, we We've come through Holy Week. We've come out on the other side. The tomb is empty. The cross is bare. Jesus is alive. He's ascended. He's returning again. Anything else for the people before we finish up today? Well, I guess to simply say what you just said, we have a Savior, people. We have a Savior, <laughs> okay? So will you quit looking for joy and happiness in having a new car and a fancy home, <laughs> okay? All these worldly things that you think are going to provide you peace, they're not going to give you any peace at all. In fact, it seems to me the most worried people I know are the people who are well-to-do. You know, I often thought if I was well-to-do, that would solve all of my problems. But uh, having had a taste of that, because we're doing pretty well here as retired pastor. Uh, uh, and I found, nah, the same worries, the same troubles, the same concerns, they're all here. And now I have to worry about losing my money. <laughs> like that help. So no. Good thing, no. good thing you have the Lord, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, and, and I constantly keep praying to the Lord, please don't let me be so foolish as to act on my sinful flesh. Uh, please do whatever you need to do to keep me and my family. Just trust and rely on you. And if that means that you have to discipline us, if it means that someday I die because I deserve to die, that's okay because you have given me a Savior. I know that for a fact. And because of that Savior, I know for a fact you will always love me no matter what. Amen to that, brother. I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend John Lukomsky, Pastor Emeritus, co-host of Wrestling with the Basics on KFUO Radio. You can hear him and fellow host, Pastor Matt Clark, on Saturdays at 9 a.m. So be sure to tune in and listen to their great program. Thank you, Pastor, for being on the show. Thank you, Pastor Boots. Always a joy to work with you. Same here. Uh, tomorrow we're going to move into chapter 11, folks. God does respond. He raises up two judges, Jephthah and Ibzan, who will deliver them. We're going to explore that narrative over the rest of the week. So be with us every day this week. Until tomorrow, though, as always, may God's peace and blessings be with you all. As we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.